guys. Um, today we have something very special. Um, uh, I'm meeting this gentleman, Bharat Vaklu, after I think uh, so from since '81, um, so 35 years. Um, and uh, every time I have, you know, so Bharat and I were together in Bits Pilani for uh, five years, where we did our bachelor's. Uh, he did it in mechanical engineering. I did it in Electrical and electronics engineering, and um, uh, the, even if you meet somebody after 35 years, I mean, uh, especially if you are staying together, um, you have an instant, uh, you know, bonding. I mean, it, just, it, it just feels like as if you know there hasn't been this gap at all. Um, and many times, so you know, whenever you get a chance after you graduate to meet, you know, people that you studied with, take all the opportunities. I remember going to Bits Pilani back after uh, in, in uh, our, our 30 year union and then 40 year union, 40 year of joining and 30 year of graduating. And it's just amazing time that we had. Uh, to, you know, on Wednesday we'll uh, see some videos from our last get together in Mandawa. Um, Bharat has had very distinguished career. Uh, he was always impressive guy even then. I mean, he just had a, you know, you talk to him and you know he's different and he, you know, he stands out uh, in a very positive way. Um, he has, uh, in the business context, he has done amazingly well. He has uh, had a number of positions at Tata Group, which is the one of the largest business groups in India. And, um, uh, the, and he, you know, kind of started new businesses there. His last uh, assignment was with Siroski, which put creates this uh, helicopters. So last two years he was managing director um, for Stiroski India uh, and uh, I think their head offices are in Connecticut so he spent a lot of time in Connecticut. And then he'll be doing something else um, uh, now. The other thing that has always excited me is, uh, and these kind of things you'll have seen often, right? I mean we are all, um, uh, you know, are quite focused on our academics, our research. And yet, if you remember, the point that I made uh, during our PhD retreat just two weeks ago, um, or was it a week ago, uh, that uh, ethics are, you know, one of the most important things. So you can do, if you don't have that, all the other things, you know, you could be in trouble, you could lose that. So, and Bharat has um, a kind of vantage point, kind of observations that none of us, you know, would have. So we have a great deal to learn from him. Before uh, passing on to him, um, in addition to his business and you know activities, um, he's written books on a variety of topics, business topics, as well as um, on Kashmir. He comes from Kashmir. We had uh, a few good uh, friends from Kashmir uh, in our batch, and uh, so in a way, you know, his, his amazing command as you'll hear on 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 language and uh, literature. So just all in all. A very unique personality that uh, we are very glad to have here at Noesis. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Amit, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm really honored and delighted to be here with you this morning. First of all, I must admit that uh, I'm deeply impressed with the kind of work that you're doing. White State and of course at Noesis. And Amit um, just gave me a, a quick walk through some of the, the extraordinary research work that's happening out here. And frankly, I was blown away because what he said and shared with me indicates to me the possibilities of how all the vast, you know, volume metrically, and you know, huge amounts of data that we have on social media, on the net, and everywhere else can be leverage to, to make life better for all of you, all, all humanity, all, all human beings and for, for our planet, which is our only hope. So, <clears throat> so great to be here, Amit, and yes, uh, I may be meeting you after 35 years, but it looks like we, we never parted in 1981, because the intervening years have just kind of, you know, uh, you know come together all of a sudden. It's kind of like a magical moment for me, therefore, so thank you very much again. Now, when Amit mentioned to me that uh, he'd like me to speak to 
uh, group of his, his colleagues here at the Mises Hub is obviously very grateful and happy and delighted to, to be able to visit and come here. And the topic that we agreed to I'd speak about would be a leading with integrity. Now, a lot of people think that, look, in this day and age, you know, this, is, this seems like just a good thing to do. You know, it's it's a, a nice thing to do. But I, I would like to you know, spend a little time explaining that this is not something that we need to do because it's a nice thing to do. It's something that underpins the whole of civilization. And if for some reason we are unable to underpin our actions, our decisions, on a platform of integrity, it can actually undermine a lot of the good that's happening around the world. And I'll, I'll explain this to you in, in more detail. So what I have done today, therefore, is I have planned my little... Uh, talk in three parts. I'll first give you an overview of how uh, ethics and rules of and regulations evolved over the past 10,000 years and why they became necessary. And then I'll spend a little time on, on the role that each one of us can play in creating a space where it is not difficult for anyone to be ethical. You know, a lot of people tell me, and I, I spend a lot of time in India, I've spent, I've lived and worked in the US as well. But people tell me that in, not just in India, but in many, many of the developing countries, it is so difficult to be honest. And how many of you have heard this, this phrase? It's difficult to be honest. It's, I'd rather pay a bribe and get away and, and rather go through the hassles of being upright. Now, this is something which I think is a worrisome area, and therefore I'll spend a little time on what we can do collectively and individually to ensure that we create spaces, we create organizations, we create uh, little, little, you know, uh, not just organization, but even, even spaces where people can be upright and ethical at all times without having to compromise their dignity, without having to compromise the dignity of others and so on. And finally, I will come to what is my most favorite part of this whole talk, which is I will speak about your personal choices to be ethical and why and how we can be uh, or why we should choose to be ethical because there are not just uh, benefits to us in the material world, there are also spiritual benefits to each of us as human beings. And I, I like to predicate that statement by saying that, look, <clears throat> whether we, we speak about this in technological uh, universities or generally about things like this, the fact remains that some of the most important things in human life are things like love and compassion and kindness and the state of how we are inside of us. And ethics, for some beautiful reason, enables us to connect the outside activities with how we feel inside. And that connection, ladies and gentlemen, is an extraordinary one. And it's an important one because for us to be wholesomely good and effective, we need to worry not just about the outside world, but even what we do inside of us. So that's how I'm going to be going ahead with my talk today. So a quick overview of the historic and historical uh, background behind uh, uh, ethics and rules and guidance. So, <clears throat> as you know, people over the past 10,000 years, human civilizations over the past 10,000 years, moved away from being hunter-gatherers to being settlers. And they settled down in cities and little tribal communes and so on. And they realized that one of the things that was essential for societies to function was that they had to have a set of rules and codes which would determine how people are behaving. Because imagine a situation where you're all by yourself, where you're alone. It wouldn't really matter how you behaved. You could, you could God forbid, kill yourself and no one would bother about it. Or you could you know, do whatever you liked and it wouldn't really affect anyone. But the moment you start living in groups, close together, ethics suddenly emerges as a very, very important requirement for order, for the continuation of life as it should be, where you also take care of certain things in such a manner that they don't bother you. You're secure in the understanding, thank you. You're secure in the understanding 
that some things have been taken care of. There is a trust that is generated from knowing that this person won't harm me or she won't harm me or he won't do anything which should subvert my interest, my well-being, my security and so on. So ancient civilizations learn from nature. There is a certain order in nature. You plant a seed, it inevitably will grow if the conditions are right. It will become a plant. It will become something worthwhile. The seasons change with a certain rhythm. The stars move, the planets, the sun rises, you know, without any change. So these were things that rulers and people noticed and said, okay, if that's how nature operates, let's make a set of rules which we will call the codes, which will govern our behavior. And in, in primitive and in fairly reasonably advanced civilizations, we noticed that there were people who would establish rules, they'd communicate them, and, and the earliest such rules were the rules of Hammurabi, which were, uh, you know, popularized and, and indicated on uh, steels and edicts and stones all over the, the kingdom that Hammurabi managed, which is, by the way, present in Iraq. And when you look at those codes, you see that it's gone into great detail. There are codes for how you will, uh, you know, uh, use your wealth, how you will marry, how you will have children, how you will deal with others, how you will transact business and so on and so forth. And that's not the only one, that's the oldest one, 1800 uh, BCE. And then of course you have the, the commandments of Moses, which came out in, in about 1500 BCE. Then you have the uh, Manu Dharm Shastra of Manu from India, about 300 BC, and so on and so forth. And that's how we went on evolving as societies. We had rules, and if you would transgress those rules, you were punished. And that was very, very clear. And typically what happened was, but these were rules not framed by, by individual citizens. These were framed by rulers who thought that they had divine sanction to make these rules. Now, moving forward, these people also understood that there was nothing absolute about these things. If a king did something wrong, it wasn't as if that, you know, it was the same as a cobbler doing something wrong. So there were contexts, there were, you know, things like social status determined whether a person had made a transgression or not. And, and so all these factors <coughs> were brought into, into play. Now, for instance, it's typically said you should always tell the truth. But we also understand that if you're accosted by a bunch of muggers and they ask you, did you see where that girl who, who ran by this way went? What will you say? Will you tell the truth? You'll probably say, no, I didn't see her or she went that way. And you'll set them off on, on another wild goose chase. So there are some things that are considered to be appropriate, but the context and the situation determines how it will be done. So for similarly, if a soldier picks up a gun and kills somebody to protect others, that's fine. So while we may say killing is bad and is unethical, under certain conditions, we understand that these things have legitimacy. Now, if that were not enough to confuse you, the fact also remains that in today's day and age, we are living in a very, very different way. Today, Technology is galloping at a rate which is absolutely unprecedented in human civilization. There's availability of knowledge, things are changing, obsolescence is real. And not just that, today's citizens aren't the quiet, subdued, passive citizens of, say, a few thousand years ago. Today's citizens are active. They are collaborating in the process of governance. They're, they think that their lives are their responsibility. And that creates a very, very different kind of a focus. A very different focus. And, and people are becoming more vocal, more empowered, more involved with what's happening around them. They're also very, very concerned and aware that today all of life is interdependent. Now, this is a trend which has been especially noticeable over the past 25 or 30 years. Everybody understands that planet Earth is our only home. And this has suddenly raised the bar as far as ethics is concerned because you realize, my God, what these guys are doing is going to wreck our only home. And that has set into motion a lot of forces, both positive and negative, which we need to contend with today. So today's situation is very, very different from what I explained in the past. Today, everybody 
is involved. Everybody has a say. Everybody thinks he or she has a right to be involved with decisions that affect their lives and the lives of people around them. So ethics is becoming more collaborative in that sense. And the more we see flawed politics and the use of power for not the greater good of all, but for, you know, personal gain, people are revolting against that. And not just in developed countries, but around the world. So this obviously adds a very, very different dimension to the whole thing. Or about this, there are also examples that we have. For instance, when you look at uh, how people have been using rules to manage uh, societies, you see that on the one hand, you might have uh, you know, people who just disregard the rules and their civil unrest. On the other hand, you also know about dictators who will crush the legitimate sentiments of people and use whatever power in their means to curb or use authoritarian methods to suppress citizens' voices, voices and rights. And similarly, there's a bunch of other, what I call, polarities that you can see. Do you want, if there's a crime done, do you want people to lynch that person? Or should a due process be followed where justice is pursued as a process? Similarly, there are antiquated rules on the basis of which people might go to jail. For instance, in India, before I, I came to the U.S. a few weeks ago, there was a big debate about this thing about, uh, uh, no, not treason, uh, what's it called? Yes, you know, uh, actions that are considered to be treasonous or where you think that somebody has committed treason by simply saying that, look, this is an archaic rule. Now, is that right? Is it wrong? And a lot of states have been relying on antiquated rules and laws to suppress the aspirations of people. Now, this is obviously another dimension. Similarly, old structures and engines are being managed by, uh, were managed by old rules, but today's structures, today's technologies are beyond it. A simple case, I'm a, my hobby is drone flying. And I love flying drones, but I was sent a letter by the FAA recently saying, hey, how are you going to drone register? And I had to go through the process. Now, drones weren't available about 35 years ago, 40 years ago, or if they were, they were only in the, in the management or, or the control of the Air Force or the Army or whatever. Now, everybody has drones, everybody has helicopters. And you need to therefore use new or create new rules to, to manage all this. So, and again, another thing happened which would change the way ethics is evolving. And that is, over the past 70 years, we have seen the growth, the rapid growth of transnational corporations. Now, transnational corporations are companies that might have a headquarters in a country A, but which have operations in countries B, C, D, E, and who might have operations that, that could be extractive, where they mine resources, or where they have manufacturing in some other countries and so on. And these kinds of transnational companies over the past seven, eight decades have become so powerful that the data that I have from 2001 shows that 300 of the top transnational companies in 2001 controlled 25% of the world's productive assets. And that's about 5.5 or 6 trillion US dollars. That even surpasses the GDP of a number of small nations. And not just nations in the sub-Saharan Africa, nations like Denmark and Germany. And, and other European Union countries as well. So when you have a transnational corporation that is so powerful, you really have to appreciate that which laws will control them? The laws where they extract their resources? Or laws in the, in the country where they're incorporated? Or where their employees come from? It's not clear. And yet, transnational corporations, by virtue of their actions, have been doing so many things which has put them completely on the collision course with regulators in many, many parts of the world. So when you look at that dimension as well, transnational corporations are today having significant battles with regulators around the globe. And I'm not just talking about companies like Microsoft and Google, who are having serious differences with regulators in the European Union and, and other parts of the world. I'm even talking about companies like Anglo-American, which is having difficulties in the nations where they extract 
their resources in Africa, in, in Asia and elsewhere. Rio Tinto had difficulties in India. So there are issues, ethical issues, which these companies are having to deal with and which we as a collective need to be aware of because if we have to create conditions where ethics becomes the way we all do our work, our respective work, or where companies comply, then we have to create conditions where we are completely aware of how they do business and how we also, uh, how they uh, relate with other organizations and, and people. And of course, uh, this is an important point to keep in mind. Many of the companies that today are functioning around the world do not really pay attention to the externalities of their business. And if you know from Economics 101, externalities means how the company's actions actually affect uh, whatever is outside of the boundaries of the enterprise and the environment, the people, the, the kind of uh, the, the interface that it has with other stakeholders around the enterprise. These things do create what I call ethical friction and something that we need to be uh, clear about. Now, I will move to part two of my little talk now. So this gives you a kind of a historical and a, a, a present day context to where ethics emerges from. And why it's important for us to understand that if you don't manage the, the friction that is currently uh, you know, palpable and visible in different parts of the world, we will, we will actually create a situation where societies will be unmanageable. Because everybody will say, look, I'm going to maximize my own personal utility. And therefore, the benefits that accrue to us as a community will begin to diminish over time. And therefore, it's important that each of us in our capacity, whatever it may be, creates conditions that favor compliance and ethical decision making. And I'm going to speak briefly about this for the next five or six minutes. Now, having said that ethics is important also from the perspective of our own spiritual well-being, I think you have to understand that if you want to create an organization that is going to be supportive of ethical decision making and integrity at all times, that organization obviously has to have certain fundamental characteristics. First and foremost, it has to very clearly articulate and state what are the values that are going to be inviolate. Because if you are ambiguous about what you're standing for, your ethical stance is going to be shifting. You've got to be able to say, I will not do this ever. Or, if I ever do it, it will only be under conditions A, B, C, and D. And that's fine. Because as I explained in the very beginning, there's nothing absolute about ethics. You have to understand that ethics will keep on changing. Uh, 150 years ago, if somebody had a, a sexual orientation that was different from what was the norm, that person could be put into jail that's thankfully not the case anymore. At that time, judges would have gone to great lengths to put such people into jail. Oscar Wilde was put into jail. So the point I'm trying to make is, you've got to be sensitive to the fact that things are changing. This is not a linear thing. There's a number of <coughs> dynamic forces at work. And many of them, with all the powerful technology that, that Amits and York demand in Noesis, might be difficult to predict with complete clarity. Yes, there'll be a high degree of understanding of what the trends are, but you still might not be able to be very, very clear. So I'm, I'm going to focus on values first. When you start off with an understanding that I'm my ethical foundation or my ethical structure is based on values that are going to benefit everybody or which are meant for the greatest good of all, you stand on better ground than if you were to say that these values are for me and me alone. I don't care about the others. Because fundamentally, as we started off in the very beginning, I said that ethics is about not you alone. It's about you living with others. And therefore you being able to do things that are beneficial for you and for the others, including planet Earth as a stakeholder. So when we look at some of these things, you see that you have to create a culture of values that are aligned with the common good of all. You cannot possibly create a space 
where values will be upheld unless you articulate and state what these are. So you've got to state them and there should be a clear linkage with the outcomes you're trying to, to uh, create as well. Then you have to create a situation or a space of openness, transparency and disclosure. One of the greatest uh, you know, lacunae of many organizations today is that they are completely opaque and a very, very renowned judge once told me, he says, transparency is like sunshine. Bring it into the organization and suddenly brightens up everything, including the dark space that might exist in the organization. So it's very, very clear that we have to have openness, transparency, and of course, you know, you prevent ethical lapses. You don't want ethical lapses to happen, then you, you know, you suddenly run around and scurry around and try to see what happened post the act or post uh, facto. Then you have to have whistleblowers, people to whom others can go and to whom they can speak openly and say, look, I, I don't think this is being done right. Or he or she, despite that they're, they're abusing their power, they're not doing things that are uh, appropriate. And have sunset clauses for, for old ideas. Now, at this stage, let me stop for a moment and give you a, more or less a, a set of four or five ideas which I think are fundamental to any ethical structure. You know, if you were to, to look throughout history and, and say, okay, what were the key ideas behind an ethical uh, society, you would see that fundamentally no society has ever favored deception or lying. And that's one continuum from deception, which is maybe a minor transgression, all the way to lying and telling lies about small or big things. So essentially the value is we have openness, honesty, uh, we, we create a space of trust and then what is spoken is meant. So keeping one's word and, and so on and so forth. The second important thing is that societies that have been ethical have created spaces where nobody has been willfully prevented from experiencing joy or happiness. Nobody's freedom has been curtailed. Nobody has been wrongly incarcerated. So again, the, the flip side of this is that you, you prevent people from experiencing joy the way you do and you incarcerate them for wrong reasons. And slavery, of course, is the worst form of that. Number three, you don't want to take away what is not yours. You don't want to steal. So the value is that you create a place where Whatever is not yours is protected, is preserved, is shared, and what is not yours is, is not taken away. And then the... But, but yeah. Beyond these, you know, important and major issues, aren't the little less um, obvious issues like uh, people uh, abusing their position or power or money to get more of it and keep others outside? Of course. And if you were to look at all these, every one of those transgressions, Amit, will fall into a combination of either these four or would stand aside. For instance, if someone is, is abusing his or her authority and making money on the side, it's a bit of this, it's a bit of this, it's, it's a combination, I think, of these two. So uh, these are like the, the building blocks of an ethical structure. And you will notice that if you have these in place, you are in a position to create a, 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 an edifice which is sufficiently reliable and capable of being a trusted organization which will foster harmony with other stakeholders as well. And the third part, of course, is the personal choice that we make in key positions. So you might have a great organization where everybody is ethical and yet you as a leader would support what's happening out there. And that is equally possibility. And that's the third part of my little presentation. But I say you might have all this, but if you make a wrong choice because of something that you think, you are equally vulnerable of subverting all that has happened. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, when we say leaders have to walk the talk, what does that really mean? It means that leaders, by virtue of being in the position that they are in, 
are able to influence a great impact on people who watch them. So they become like role models for everybody else in the organization. And if the role model does something flawed, there can be two responses. Either people will go to the whistle and say, my God, this guy's lost it. Which is often the reason why a whistleblower is, is, is planned for in organizations, to enable people to speak up their minds. But very often, people might be scared to even report such a, an act, action. And they might say, well, if he does it, I might as well do it as well. And that would simply mean you short circuit all these good values. And, and it happens. It happens all the time. Which is why I'm, I, I continuously remind myself and everybody else that ethics is about continued vigilance. You have to be vigilant at all times. You've got to be really mindful, really aware, really alert at every single moment. Because it's not as if you're, you know, it's like driving on the highway at a very, very high speed on the autobahn where there's no speed limit. On the autobahn, you can be at any speed, but if you are not mindful, you'll not be on the autobahn for very long. And that's exactly how it is here as well. And of course, finally, we talked about see, see, stealing and of course safeguarding others, not hurting or putting others in, in the way of harm, not depriving them of life. A very, very fundamental idea at a building now. And of course, uh, if organizations have to be created that are supportive of these values, you have to have a system of enforcement. And not just enforcement, even a certainty should, should we must all be certain that if there were a transgression, there would be negative consequences for people to bear. Very often, good systems, well-designed systems flounder simply because we are unable to enforce those rules or values consistently. People say, oh my God, that guy, that guy's a crook and nothing's happened to that guy. I mean, I'm not going to Ambedkar. I'm going to <laughs> Sorry, I moved my hand in the wrong direction. But you know, it does happen all the time. We say, "My God, I know that guy. He's he's a fraud. What's he doing out here?" And he's there, and nothing's happened to him or her. And you wonder, what kind of a system is this? You know, that's how doubts arise. And so I'm saying that you've got to have timely enforcement. A weeding out of transgressors and violators. And look, I'm saying this to you today because you will be in positions where you will have to take this call. That's a decision you'll have to take. Very often people say, oh no, I'm a friend of this guy. Why should I do it? You know, this guy's been so good to me. You know, he gets me coffee every morning for the past 10 years and I can't sack him. All. Sorry. There is, to, to use the Indian term dharma, your dharma in a certain role requires you to do things however personally difficult they might be for you. And that is something which is a, a leadership quality. I may be a great friend of someone, but if that person is doing something that's not right and you said it's not right, then you have to take time the action. And there is only one rule that, uh, that's applicable to all. You can't say, oh, I'm the head of the department, therefore I, I'm you know, immune to all these violations. Sorry. One rule, one law for everybody. You know, the tragedy of the world today is that if you look around the world, you will see a lot of conflict arising because the rules are being applied non-uniformly. I am the president of a nation and I will therefore apply the rules differently to me or I will not apply them to myself at all. I will apply them only to people who are not in my favor and put them in jail. Horrible! Terrible. And this is what creates friction. This is what creates violence in the world. And furthermore, for the due process of law, you can't have lynchings and you can't pick up a guy just because you don't like that person's face. Consistency and certainty of punishment for a transgression is the greatest way to uphold a system. If there is no assurance that a system will behave as predicted, it's chaos, anarchy. And, and you as experts in the theory of knowledge, you would know that if for some reason there is no assurance that the system is not going to function the way it's meant to function, it can actually create serious consequences. And of course, a management of polarities in the, in the effective manner. Incentives and training, this is very, very obvious. I mentioned this in the very beginning. It's, it's easy for people to, 
to not be ethical if the system pushes you into a corner and you have to really fight to be honest. I know of people who are extremely wonderful people push the wall because they are forced to be unethical by the system. And that's why the system has to be incentivized. And this is a very, very powerful word. You know, <clears throat> in one of my first books, I wrote about a thing called the PAMS alignment, which really means the principles that you measure and the actions that you evaluate and the actions that you reward must be completely in alignment. If there is a misalignment and you say, oh, we are an extremely uh, customer-oriented organization and then the customer comes with a faulty product and says, can I have a replacement with yourself? Get lost. And you reward the guy who says this, your value goes, gets grounded instantaneously. It's as simple as that. And that's why incentive development, incentive creation, in a way that makes it easy for integrity-centered systems to be created is essential. Punishment for transgressions, rewards for ethical performance, and frequent training, ease of understanding of rules. People should not say, oh my God, what, what kind of a complicated thing is this? They should be able to understand what's going on. And finally, helping people to align their ethical intentions with the skills required. I need to dwell on this for a moment because a lot of people think that, hey, ethics is simple. I know what's right and wrong and that's it. Are they ethical? Sorry, it's not as simple as that. You may see a bicycle, you may see how it operates, but unless you sit on it and start to balance yourself on it, you will never be able to ride it. That's true for ethics as well. Ethics is not just about knowing what's right and wrong. Ethics is having the skills to navigate the space that will keep you ethical at all times. And it really is a skill. It is a skill that comes from being mindful, by being alert, by being conscious, by practicing your ethical muscle. And what is your ethical muscle? It's your mind understanding because ethics is about your interiority it's not about what's happening outside outside you will have systems but at the end of the day and that's what brings me to the final part which is transgression or compliance is a personal choice after all this after all the understanding that you might have about what's good what's not good you know no stealing no abuse of power you're now chief operating officer of a big corporation and the decision has to be taken by you and there is a conflict your friend's company has sent you a purchase uh, request or a you know a request for a boat has come from your friend's company and from another company your friend's company is 10 cents per widget more expensive that one is not dilemma how do you deal with it? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the skill part and the choice part because that's where your cognitive ability and your ethical skills and mindful training, mindfulness training is going to come into way. So basically in this, I want to start by saying that the individual choices matter and you have a significant role to play in making this whole world more ethical by your own individual choices. And if you look at history, human history, people have actually gone in the face of law or the so-called law at that time because they were fundamentally unjust rules. Individuals, Dr. Martin Luther King, Henry VIII, who went against the Christian church in the 16th century, not for a good reason, but he went against church. The church had said you can't divorce Catherine of Aragon, then you can't marry Anne Boleyn, and therefore, on that, on those grounds alone, he he broke off from the Catholic Church in Rome, and, and that's why the Anglican Church is a Protestant church, not Catholic, even though Britain was Roman Catholic in the early days. So things like that have happened. Of course, this Henry VIII example is is a little, it's a bit of an outlier, but it essentially shows that look, it's possible for people to take a stand. 
Mahatma Gandhi in India, whose birth centenary we celebrated yesterday, he took a stand against the unjust rules and laws of the British in India and took a stand, personal stand. He was a simple man like, like all of us. And there have been many, many more people like that. Dr. Ambedkar, even Siddharth Gautam Buddha, 2,200 years ago. Everybody has taken a stand. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are no less. If you wish to take a stand, you can take a stand. That's my point. And I want you also to know that given the fact that we are living in a world where, if I go back to that earlier uh, diagram I had shown, this one, if you look at this diagram and, and look calmly at this whole thing, you will see that lawmakers, however bright, however hardworking they are, will be unable to create sufficient rules and regulations for all of us to be in a position to be on top of what's happening in society. That's never going to be. We'll always have a situation where self-regulation is going to become the norm. It's happening even now. You're on, on Facebook or Twitter, apart from the fact that on Twitter you have a 140 character limitation, what else limits you? You can write anything you like. But are you going to write anything you like? Or would you rather write what is harmonious and what is going to induce trust and integrate? That's the key point. And that's what self-regulation is all about. You cannot monitor the world wide web. You can't monitor a lot of things in your life anymore because the laws are changed. I mean, the laws we have can't keep pace with the change. And this is bound to be. However hard Amit legislative organizations or bodies in, in the US or in the rest of the world might function, the laws will always be a few generations out of sync with technology, with social structures, with decisions, with innovations. And that's going to be the reality going forward. So in that situation, what do you do? Do you kind of just wait and say, hey, there's no law for this. Let me break the law and have fun until the law gets created. No, because that would be detrimental to your own well-being. So instead, you self-regulate. You start to understand that lawmakers can't keep pace with all that's happening. You've got to be your own lawmaker. And your own internal ethical governors will be the basis for your journey through life and through this whole social uh, process of growing up and, and so on. And therefore you have to perfect and master ethical thinking and you have to consciously choose what I call the hard right over very often the easy wrong. The wrong is easy. My friend's company. Come on. Send him the order. Easy wrong, hard right. It's a balance. It's something that you have to consciously weigh in your mind and be alert and be aware and be mindful. Okay, now another point I want to make here. How we think about ourselves in relation to the world has a big bearing on how ethical we are. How many of you really think that uh, what you do has no impact on the rest of the world? That means whatever you do has no impact. And I'm not talking about work that you do as part of your profession. I'm saying even the words you speak privately do you think that has a bearing anywhere in the world? If you think it has, then fine. If not, then maybe you need to think your ideas are fresh because the fact is, you know, we are all temporary travelers on planet Earth. You have 95 years to make a difference. That's it. After which you will, your physical bodies will be dropped off. Now, if that is an attitude that you have, then things like your, your whole perspective towards the earth will change. For instance, you understand that, look, this is my ship. On this ship, whatever is there is all mine, all ours. What's there a hold for? Because 95 years later, even this body, which I call my own, has to be dropped off. So with that perspective, many of the things that people do unconsciously, I think, which are unethical, you might stop doing those things because then you realize, hey, gosh, I'm, I'm just a temporary traveler. I'm a, a 
travel the people. So what, what good does it make if I hurt people, if I deceive people, if I tell lies? What's going on? You know, your paradigms change. And I, I'm of the view that the right paradigms have to be in your mind because decisions and actions which emerge from the understanding that you are interconnected with everybody else and therefore whatever you do has a bearing on others as well is a, is a good place to start. And similarly, you need to also therefore explore paradigms and beliefs that are preventing you from behaving as you believe. If, and this is something that you have to do in, your, in the private time, in the quiet time that you spend with yourself. If you really think that you have been, you know, you, you fib too much, you lie too much and that can become a bad habit, go back, check it out. Am I doing something that's inappropriate? Check it out. Because that is really part of the process. Your own belief system must reinforce ethical values. Now, this is a personal growth process. It's not something that anyone can do for you from the outside. Because all these things, friends, happens inside of you, in your, what I call, your interiority. And in my forthcoming book, which is called Navigating the Maze, and that's not meant, for, well, actually it's meant for an audience like this, it's meant for young professionals. <coughs> that book really talks about this in greater detail, and I'd recommend that you buy it when it's out next month. Navigating the Maze, smart, uh, simple, smarter strategies to fast-track success. That's the name of the book. But the fact is, this is an essential part of living a, a good life, living an ethical life, yes. Excuse me. Tell me your so, name as well, please. Um, some people have your name, Saida. Saida, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Go ahead, Saida, yes. Uh, some people have a wrong belief system and they are not aware of um, this belief system is uh, unethical. So what, I mean, they are not in this cycle of reinforcing I, I understand what you're saying, Saida, is very true. There are many, many cultures in the world where we do have people who think that uh, this is a very, very high bar of being ethical. But I think, let's let's go back to that earlier slide I just put up about what are the values that, uh, you know, what are the factors that actually create an ethical structure. If you look at all these, in every culture in the world, Saida, these are absolutely and if you extend these, and I'll explain to you how you extend them, I will explain to you in a moment. Then if you extend them, understanding that love and wholesomeness is the basis, you will see that these can be extended into any dimension. Now what I mean by this, what I'm trying to say is those four or five points that I made earlier about what are the fundamental building blocks. You have to understand that whatever integrates is ethical and that which separates is unethical. So if you have a leader who is trying to create dissension, separate people, nations, groups, it's not wholesome. It is not creating a collective good. It's not based on what you might call a feeling of love, which is an important inner feeling for all of us as human beings. He or she is creating violence, which will emanate by creating groups. So whatever is separating us as human beings it doesn't matter where you come from which part of the world what religion you follow it doesn't matter anything which separates is unethical i don't want to be commenting about the presidential candidates in the us but one of the reasons one of them is not liked is because fundamentally it rankles our concept of love and wholesomeness because we know that what separates is unethical it, it is deeply ingrained in us as human beings don't forget that some of the most civilized cultures in the world have said that the world consists of humanity, which is one family. And that idea stems from this. And love is a manifestation of the desire of all humans to integrate with their source. What is the source? The source is what makes you alive. The source of your intelligence, the source of your ability to breathe, to perform as human being. Life is one integrated whole. There is no separation. The food I eat is given by Mother Earth or Planet Earth. The, the beautiful animals I watch in the jungles are part of life as well. I'm part of that life. 
when you start thinking on those lines, when you start thinking on about the fact that Earth is our only home and we are one family and I'm a part of the interconnected <laughs> wholesomeness of life, then say that you will understand that it is possible to stretch those four or five points into any dimension you like. But I also agree with you, there are people who say, no, I don't believe in this. So you got to work on them. No, they even do, are not aware of that is honest. You know? Yeah, so that's why it is important for such people to very lovingly to be educated. <laughs> <laughs> lovingly. I said that consciously because frankly, there is no... An ethical approach is not a violent approach. An ethical approach is a very, very harmonious approach. We always will have differences. That is the whole nature of, of progress. We progress because our people say, no, this is how we should do it. You say, no, this is and then you find a middle ground. But there is no space for violence. It is a harmonious movement into integration. Harmonious movement into integration. You see, please understand. Even the concept of nations is a, an artificial construct. Is planet Earth divided as a planet? No, it isn't. Planet Earth is one. Humans have created these little boundaries and all that. That's fine. As long as we understand that these boundaries are not boundaries for minimizing any of this. Our, our view of the world should not be cons constricted by the fact that there's a boundary around my country or another uh, around another country. I must still look at planet Earth as one planet. And I'm saying this with a purpose because many of the you know problems that we encounter in the in the environmental space, for instance, arise because people are blinkering themselves and saying, hey, I'm only worried about this. And I'll throw the garbage away. Where do you throw the garbage away? Please tell me. On one planet, where do you throw the garbage? It's like saying, oh, I'm on a ship and I'm throwing the garbage away. And you don't have the option of putting it anywhere else, overboard, because there is no overboard. <laughs> it's all here. So, I really think that, you know, we are, and, and I really mean you all, you are the future leaders of planet Earth. And you are also very, very smart. You couldn't have been sitting in this classroom at the uh, Noesis Center if you weren't really, really sharp people. But I also want you to know that don't ever lose touch with what's inside of you. Because what's inside of you really is what makes you human. It makes you, it connects you to your to the planet that you're in. And at the heart of it all, we are all Deeply, deeply impacted by love and a, a need for wholesomeness with every, everything in life. Connectedness. Because we are not, you know, you must have heard this phrase about us being social organisms or social animals. The fact is, we are far more than social. We love being together, in touch. And therefore, anything which supports that intrinsic human desire is ethical. Anything which does not support that is unethical. And finally, let me wrap up by saying that, look, ethical leadership is all about a mindful application of these ideas. Your decisions and intentions that lead to action are taken now. You know, if you want to think of life, when is life happening? Life doesn't happen tomorrow when you're at the, at the pub or at the discotheque. Life is happening now, right now as we are here together. What's happened in the past is completely, it's completely gone. It's just a memory in your mind. There's nothing else. Think about it. And even the future is just a thought in your minds. It may or may not happen. The only reality is this moment. Now in front of you, a decision document comes or an email on your computer comes and you have to take a decision. That decision can only be taken now. Now means in the present moment. And therefore being able to develop the process of being mindful and applying the skills of being ethical now 
will always give rise to the appropriate decisions. It's not as you have to refer to some rule book or some codex or some, you know, document. It's all there in you. It's all there with you and with training and a little understanding of the points that we just made, you will get better and better. And the other important point is that in, in, in the Indian uh, philosophical system, we talk about two terms, dharm and shil. What does this really mean? This means even if the whole world were to get annihilated and we were to start afresh, we would still be able to start ethically because that is number one, the way we are. You know, we are intrinsically driven by good things and, and of being together and wholesome. And therefore we need to resort to nothing but our own thinking skills and mindful self-regulation. That's all. So it's not as if you have to have a, a huge tome or a huge book. You know, please tell me, democracies like the US and India have documents called the Constitution. You know, and, and America has a very, very elaborate Constitution, so does India. How many politicians have actually read those documents? Good politicians don't need to read them. Because what the document says is based on what is essentially appropriate, ethical, integrating, wholesome, loving. You know, it, it all stems from those sentiments. Similarly for the US. And yet you will notice even though the books exist, even though you have digitized documentation on the American Constitution and the Indian Constitution, how many people in America and in India violate the fundamental principles of the Constitution? I can tell you it's a large number of politicians. Why? Because they are not self-regulating, they are not mindful. And they are not using the thinking skills right. So it, it really boils down to these very, very fundamental tools that you have at your command to be able to use, to be able to remain ethical all the time. And the beauty is, these are inner resources. They are not resources that come from the outside. Thinking, it's all there with you. The skills of thinking through, which means analytical skills, again, it's an inner resource. Being mindful, again, an inner resource. And these inner resources are there with you all the time. And that alone can be tapped into to create a harmonious society. So to wrap up then, let me quickly summarize what I said. I said, number one, that historically there was a reason why we felt that we had to have rules and regulations and, and commandments which had to be followed. There was usually somebody who was a punitive leader who would, or there were people assigned the role of identifying transgressions and, and enforcing the law. All this made sense when humanity and social systems didn't change. Today, we are in a different world. Today, every one of us is a citizen leader. I am armed with a mobile phone. I have a wireless connection. I have Twitter. I have uh, Facebook. I have email. I can rule the world in a sense. I can foment discord. Or I can foment accord. I can get people together. I can create a schism. Entirely up to me. And you're seeing it on Facebook. I see so much obnoxious material on the Facebook. And I'm very grateful, therefore, that you, Amit, and your team are working on a, on a program. On a, uh, harassment. Uh, yes, on harassment. It's a very, very powerful, uh, a very important area. So in this day and age, something more is required. And that is self-regulation. And self-regulation as I said, comes from understanding the fundamental building blocks, understanding mindfulness, understanding that your interior is your biggest guide, and more importantly, if you are in a position of leadership where you can make a difference, start with a value, uh, set of values, create a culture of values, articulate those values, make sure the incentivized systems that you create in the organization support those values, and let everybody feel that this is an organization worth being part of. So with that, thank you very much. I am now open for questions. And once again, Amit, thank you for having me over here. Delighted to be here. This has been an extraordinary audience. I appreciate your 
attention and I'll be very, very glad to answer any further questions. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Um, are ethics objective? Your name, please. Oh, I like Sarasi to respond. And Sarasi. Sarasi, okay. Are ethics uh, objective or subjective? Is ethics objective or subjective? Ethics at one level is subjective. And I'll tell you why. By subjective, I mean that it is something which is fundamental to, to life. But a manifestation of ethics is objective. A manifestation of ethics, uh, of ethics is objective. Does it make sense? So when it comes to the case that it can be subjective, like for 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 something, I'll I'll be thinking it is ethical, but some might be thinking no, it is not ethical. So how how do we how do we so because ethics will evolve into a rule in some Of days. course. How, how of do course. we? You know, uh, this is a very good question and uh, Sarasi, my, my short answer to this would be that depending on the context and where you are living, you would get guidance on how to interpret the dissonance, if at all. Which means in many parts of the world, for instance, uh, uh, gay marriage is still unethical. Now, I personally, I'm, I'm completely comfortable with the idea of two people getting together irrespective of their gender. Now, if I'm going to be breaking a certain law in some nation by propagating this, maybe I'll be a little, you know, gentle about how I break it out or how I speak about this or how I, you know, advise others. But fundamentally at my, at the subjective level inside of me, it remains inviolate. I, I completely go by this because I do believe that this is something that, that brings people together in love and it's wonderful. Love, integrity, wholesomeness, these are my, my markers for what is appropriate. But yes, you have, to, you have to be smart. You have to think, where am I talking about this? Am I talking about it in a culture where there's still resistance? And that's fine. That's, that's part of the problem being human. There may be other way of thinking, or, or I don't know whether this other. Um, such thing as everybody has a right to leave. Or, you know, thing about pursuit of happiness, happiness this of course. kind of stuff, right? In Absolutely. The so that becomes kind of objective in that nobody has a right to take. There's no subjective that you can take somebody else's life or you should, you know. But then we are all kind of social animals. We are, we have kind of different societies. We have societies as a whole by nation, by civilization, by smaller levels. And there, each of us have chosen to interpret it a little differently. There, it becomes subjective. So, in uh, uh, Uganda, you know, the LGBT rights are, you know, really uh, not accepted. And in other places, they are. Um, and then there is always this challenge, uh, who is more right? Um, in a... Uh, in a society, what might be called ethical may not be called ethical in other societies exactly. at all. Exactly. So that becomes, you know, as you said, subjective in a way. But there's, exactly. I think there is so there are some fundamental principles that are still objective. Which are those building blocks that I shared with you? On those, there's generally no no argument, right? Those are by and large taken to be the, the gold standard as far as the building blocks are concerned. However, I still want to maintain that because of the the dynamic nature of human evolution, what might seem unreasonable today will become reasonable tomorrow. And that's fine. And you, but you should be in a position to foresee this because of your ability to use these ideas to kind of look ahead of the curve in a sense. Because lawmakers, as I said, will always be a few steps behind where society is, especially today's society where every day you have new things happening. There are new challenges, new challenges from technology, new challenges from new structures, social structures, new communications patterns, interactions. It's, it's a whole new world. And lawmakers with their antiquated systems just can't keep pace with it. And therefore self-regulation, self-management becomes the, the hallmark of that, that approach. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, yes, please. 
Yeah, my, uh, so my name is Manas. Okay. Manas. And uh, the question is basically is uh, the choice of profession, is it governed by ethics? Uh, Manas, by, by asking this question, you're, you're assuming that certain professions are intrinsically unethical or inappropriate for an ethical person, right? Uh, not exactly. It's basically uh, when I run around my circle, my colleagues, uh, I basically tend to uh, listen from them that after my certain set of internships in particular firm, I have decided to go to academia. Okay. And some people say that I was not uh, basically well, uh, uh, was not, not well basically uh, the, uh, what we can properly say is, I was not basically uh, ready. Uh, Ready not for judged or basically practiced by a, that particular group in that company because of which I'm basically moving to this particular area. Okay. okay. So my question is basically is governing, uh, is basically moving to a particular profession or choice of a profession is governed by an ethics? Let me, let me put it this way. A choice of profession is governed by two or three factors. One of them is your personal likes and dislikes. Number two, your own experiences as an intern with these organizations. And number three, the, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the position that you get in the organization and so on. I don't think uh, your own standard of ethics at a starting level will really play a major role in your decision. However, as you get along in the organization, if you notice, that you are being asked to do things which are intrinsically unethical or they, they fly in the face of what you think is appropriate and honest, you might have second thoughts and you might actually then look around for another job. So it does happen. I was very, very fortunate to, to have worked for about 30 years with an Indian transnational company called uh, Tata, Tata Group. And they are by and large an ethical group. So, in my case, I never experienced any dissonance in any jobs. And I was at one time responsible for a spend of almost uh, 4,000 crore rupees. A crore is 10 raised power 7. So, I was actually responsible for about 4,000 crore rupees of spend because I was the head of the supply chain for the entire group. So, everything that was procured from Australia to America, I was responsible for that. So, but there were lots of pressures on me to, to bend this or that way. But I, I took a stand and I was very, very happy doing that job. And I saved the company. Would you have managed to do this? This was uh, InfoScar's uh, data, data group. group. Would you have managed to do this in Reliance? Probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because so, now, now that's, that's a good, good point that Amit is making. Because oh. yes, Reliance is known to be a company that, that sometimes does bend rules in its own favor. And that's why I, I mentioned transnational companies around the world. I said transnational companies are known to lobby with national governments to, to get favors for themselves, often at the cost of other stakeholders. And that is unethical because as I said, that which separates is not ethical, which integrates, which brings everybody's interest to the fore is ethical. So I hope I've answered your question about this. So you lobby uh, to relax uh, environmental rules for your you know, profit. Oh, exactly. I mean, it's going to affect so many people downstream. So, uh, so that comes like for when a second, uh, another question, like when you adapt to someone's ethics, is it ethical or is it unethical? Uh, the assumption, again, that you're making, man, this is that the, uh, the ethical standards of that party are lower than your own, right? If they're higher than yours, of course, you'd say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I would, that's a no-brainer, really. Yeah. But the assumption, the unsaid uh, point in your question was that the standards, ethical standards of the other party are lower than your own personal standards. Are those, the question that you should ask then is, are those standards above the law or below the law? Okay. Because, please appreciate, ethical standards are sometimes way, way above the law. Because as I kept keep on, as I kept on mentioning all along, the law is never able to catch up. Ethics will always be higher, higher, higher. So you, as a human being, 
might have a standard that's here, but the law may be here, and you can still live with that situation. Now, if this party has standards, ethical standards, that are below the law, you need to be worried about it, because then you can go to jail. Yes. Because if the enforcement is good, you'll be pulled up. That's a worrisome situation. And I've, I've known managers who inadvertently have, have gone through a process and been found out, and they've had to suffer by going to jail after that. And that's not a good situation to be in. But that said, if the law is still, you know, let's say your sta ethical standards are here, this party is here and the law is here, I think you're okay. But it's not as straightforward as this. You can't kind of quantify these levels that easily. But, uh, so it's really your own judgment. But here, here is a uh, thing you can possibly reflect on. When you know that an ethical standard could be higher, okay. you are lawful. Uh, and uh, you as, uh, you know, person in leadership role in, you know, serious, significant, even high business position, make those choices. What does it do to your happiness or, uh, you know, eventual, you know, how, how do you take it after that? I mean, you got success for you, you got more money for your organization, but how do you live with that? Uh, have you seen, you know... You know, I, I must tell you very frankly, I have had the... Uh, good fortune of interacting with a large number of executives from very, very diverse parts of the world and who work for different companies. I can tell you one thing. At the end of the day, people are most comfortable with those companies that make them feel good inside. And this is the short answer to what you have said, Amit. So a person may have made a lot of money doing fraudulent things and so on but the person may be in extreme pain inside and that will show up in, in multiple ways. On the contrary, a guy may be in a good position at a fairly decent point, is, is bypassed for a promotion just because this person is seen to be too ethical. And, and people say that in the corporate sector. I've heard HR executives say, hey, this guy is too ethical. I said, what does that mean, too ethical? Ethical is good. No, no, but no, too ethical. Obviously, you know what the meaning is. He's not greasing the right arm. He's not greasing the right arm. He's not saying the right things. He's not elbowing out his competitors or whatever, doing all kinds of crazy things. And the person may be, you know, overshot when it comes to promotion. But when this person, you talk to the person, he says, I'm delighted, I'm happy. And believe me, Harvard has done a, a study which was an uninterrupted study for 75 years figuring out what really do human beings care about. And this study, uh, the findings were revealed a few years ago, and this study is amazing. The study says that people don't care about money, they don't care about where they work, where they lived, uh, they got a big home that they had, or the, how many swimming pools, or how many cars they had. Guess what? They are really concerned about things like, oh, I'm so glad I have a loving spouse or a good family or good friends to be with. I and, and the regrets, oh I wish I hadn't treated that person harshly. Oh I spoke to so and so very negatively. Oh I wish I hadn't been mean. Oh I wish I hadn't been deceptive to that person. Can you imagine? It's all about our interiority. It's nothing about the outside. Your cars, your home, your you know yacht, the the helicopter that you have parked in, in the uh, Oakland airport here or whatever. So how many of you have uh, read whether that is right or wrong? I don't know, but there is a statement about Steve Jobs at the end, you know, of his life, what he says. Have, how many of you have seen that? It's, it's very widely on I, social I see, media. I've seen that, yeah, yeah? I've seen that. Yeah. That uh, at the end of the day he said, you know, I had all this power and money and, uh, you know, only thing that, but, but I didn't have that much of a family. And that's what I miss the most. And, and the family, you, know, you can see in a broader sense, of course, your blood family is important, but other families also, as you, some people can develop, can be in a position to develop a broader family of the thing, right? So, As a matter of fact, uh, somebody who had worked uh, in Apple told me that in, within Apple, Steve Jobs was supposed to be a tyrant. He was yeah. supposed to be extremely mean, my yeah, dear. Yeah. Mean and, and, you know, abusive yeah. or, and, you know, it really, really be harsh on his managers and probably regretted that. Very good. Yeah, yes, please. Um, I'm Hussain. Hussain, yes, Hussain. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, so here is one question. In my picture, we know that 
that there is a saying that says, um, the one who knows the road is different from the one who walks in the road. So it's amazing that we know all of these things, but how do you evaluate yourself that you are actually moral and ethical? Because I can say like, okay, I know all of these things and I am ethical, but how would you evaluate yourself? Yeah, let me, let me go back. I think that's a very, very good question. I, I did make this point about, uh, you know, uh, what is wholesome and integrating is ethical. I mean, that is the short and easy answer. Now, if it is also, if it contributes to greater engagement in kindness and love with other people, it is ethical. If it is coming in the way of that, it is unethical. This is a short and simple test. That's point number one. Point number two, you have to be continuously watchful. Because our mind is also ground for an amazing amount of delusion. I can delude myself into believing that, oh, I know everything. and There's nothing more to learn. I'm, I'm on top of my, my game, so to say. I'm sorry, that, that kind of arrogance is again an enemy. You have to be humble and you have to be grateful for whatever you know, but you have to continuously be watchful and mindful of the fact that there is no stopping till the last breath in your body, Hussein. You got to keep on learning and perfecting and perfecting your art of being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.